Watch this. After months of buildup, Idaho ends up pretty much where it already was. Oh, there were a few surprises from yesterday's election, so there are a few things for us to talk about now that the dust has settled. And we're going to do that with both party leaders and political experts on what did and didn't change. It may have been the fastest trigger finger in the West. Mere moments after polls closed in Idaho, we knew who would be returning to the governor's office for a second term. How can the known authority, the Associated Press, be so quick on the draw? You know, election night can change a lot, or it can change very little. It's the hours where the prognostications of political pundits are put aside and we see what the voters have to say. Of course, we all heard the national prediction of a red wave rolling over through the midterms. That wave is something you can count on here in Idaho, kind of like the schedule at the Boise Whitewater Park. You can expect some new faces, sure, but in terms of what party controls what here, Idaho seems to have the same identity. What does that mean, though, for Republicans who control all statewide constitutional offices yet again? And what does it mean for the Democrats who held their own to protect their seats at the State House? Here's Andrew Bartline. A successful election night for the Idaho GOP, punctuated with a sweep of every statewide constitutional office. It's an outcome GOP leadership expected. What the voters were saying is they appreciate the way that the state is run. House Majority There's Caucus leader Megan change. Blanksma adds new House leadership is on the horizon. That's partly due to a 46% turnover rate in the House. That generally happens, you know, in, in one of these redistricting years. And new blood is always nice to have. So I don't, I don't think that it's something to be scared or concerned about. I think it's something to be excited about. And I'm, I'm happy that I get to work with some of these people. And while the people are new, the teams remain largely unchanged. Neither Democrats or Republicans gain seats on either side of the state house, despite some shuffling. Every possible seat, every purple seat, we work really hard for. Democratic because Party Chair said, Lauren Nekachea says this was a big win for the Democrats. In a Republican-controlled state, she says her party finds success on the margins. The Democrats maintained their margin in key districts, including the Wood River Valley. The Dems swept the district, maintaining all three state house seats. We put a lot of effort in there um, as a party. We stationed an organizer there. We've been door knocking there relentlessly. Perhaps that was going to lean more Republican, and we just didn't end up doing that. And we're in the process of trying to figure out what happened there. But one of the Democrats' biggest wins came elsewhere. I learned that we can flip a seat like we did in District 15 when we get out and talk to the voters. And when we can talk one on one, we can share just how closely aligned Idaho Democratic values are with just your regular voters of Idaho. Nekachea adds she doesn't like what she sees from the other side of the aisle. The growing extremism is going to be taken to new heights with some of these new legislators. And I think there are people who are frankly unfit for public office who are now going to hold legislative seats, and that's concerning to me. Overwhelmingly, Idahoans chose Republicans to lead the state, and, and that's just facts. That's what we know. And so to say that, that Republicans are extremists or that they aren't in touch with their communities, I think if you go and you look at the vote totals and you look at so many districts were so overwhelmingly Republican, where Democrats didn't even field a candidate because they knew what those communities looked like. We have a disconnect in that we have voters who I think vote Republican out of habit. They have historically. Just if you want to see how extreme the Idaho Republican Party is getting, they're, they're telling us in their platform. Both parties are heavily anticipating state house leadership. The Speaker of the House is a good example of what we're looking at with Scott Bedke becoming the lieutenant governor elect. That role will now have a new face. And for the Republicans, Brian, it's going to be who's going to be one of their leaders to help push that party forward and what they want to accomplish. And then for the Democrats, it's who are they going to have to work with or perhaps who are they going to have to work against? Because I asked both parties, mm -hmm. what is that going to look like with these new faces working together with each other? And they said, well, sometimes it's tough to work together at all. So we'll see how that works out and how people get along with these new faces. Yeah, uh, the platform she's refer referring to with the Republican Party has to do with no abortion, no exception kind of thing. Also, what can and cannot be taught in schools. They mentioned CRT in their platform they passed this past summer at their convention. But the terms of uh, people just voting Republican because they're just used to that, I mean, does that kind of... That's what they're falling back on when it comes to the Democratic Party right now? Well, that's what they said. Nekachea told me, like, we're the party of the people. We're the mm -hmm. party that's doing the things the people of Idaho want. And I pushed back on her a little bit mm -hmm. and I said, 
well, then why are you losing so many elections where this is a Republican-controlled state? We saw those margins where Little won by 41 points for right. the governor's seat. And she says, well, we know that people are stuck in their ways. This is a Republican state. It has been for a long time. It's going to take a long time to change that. That was her logic. Party for the people, but not these people, apparently. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay, so this is where we're going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Stephanie Witt, who joins us again like she was last night uh, from uh, the coverage of the election, a uh, political science professor at Boise State University. And a couple things we wanted to talk about. Andrew kind of touched on a little bit and the percentage points when it comes to who won what and by how much. But the turnout, we're looking at that a little bit. Mm -hmm. This year seems to be a little bit down from where it was in 2018, 59% versus 67%. Still some outstanding votes to be counted, but that's kind of where we're sitting right now. Yeah. Does that surprise you? No, not at all. Uh, there's always a drop off, as you know, between the presidential election and the midterm election. Mm -hmm. So we always expect that. The last midterm we had, which would have been the 2018 election, we had an open governor's seat. True. So a lot of attention directed at that race. And I think a lot of people show up to vote for the governor. This time we had a sitting incumbent governor. Uh, and while the Democrats are working on it, I wouldn't say this is their strongest slate of candidates that I've seen in the last several cycles. So I think uh, there just wasn't as much buzz about this one. That's true. Okay, so Andrew touched on this as well. When, of course, the legislature stays the same with the number of seats, both Democrat and Republican. Yeah. Does that surprise you, even though we just had redistricting because of the census? Yeah, that, that was kind of funny. When you add it all up, it's the same it's as the it same. was yesterday. So, right. Um, but there were uh, some flips, that just that they evened out, right? Yeah. yeah the, um, the seat up with Latah County where mm -hmm. uh, the Democrat lost, and then we had the Dec Democrats gain a seat down here, District 15, which you just reviewed. So it's still a daunting figure. I mean, I always like to joke, does it pass the potluck test? Have we have enough Democrats that they could actually have a decent potluck? Maybe. Maybe. And this is yeah. what we talked about, too. They're going to need each other for yeah. some of these bigger issues. Well, I do think that in some of the budget issues, what we've seen is that the far right on the Republican Party votes no. And to get the budgets through, the more mainstream Republicans, the House leadership has had to rely on the Democrat votes for yes. So I, it'll be interesting to see if they, they still, I guess that's, you could call that working together. Uh, they need each other to get some of those uh, big budgets through. I think the continuing concern on the far right about critical race theory, school budgets, you know, the commission for the library's budget was attacked this last year. Yeah. They're going to stay on those kinds of things. So the Democrats are needed votes to mm -hmm. get the budgets through on those things. Okay, so the balance of power in the legislature stays the same, but yeah. there was this constitutional amendment that kind of tried to equal out this balance of power when yeah. it comes to the executive and the legislative branch. Yeah. We were talking last night going into this, uh, oh, it looks like it's, you know, a lot of people saying no. It flipped around. Yeah, so much for my predictive powers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I thought for sure this was not going to pass, but it did. Um, and interestingly, there were two other states that had a similar amendment to their constitution mm -hmm. to allow their legislatures to call themselves back into session. Those two failed in uh, Kentucky and Arkansas. Hmm. Ours passed yes. uh, very near. I mean, 52%, yeah. 287,000 so far said yes. Yes. They want the legislature to be allowed to call themselves back into session. Wow, yes. Uh, so look, look for our uh, public servants to be back with us multiple times. Yeah, and especially considering what happened in 2020, if something happens along the way they don't agree with, they want a little bit more control as opposed to, say, executive orders, mm -hmm. they can come back in and if they get 60% of them to do that, to agree to that. It's my understanding that the Utah legislature has, has activated this power sure. multiple times multiple since times. they got it. Yeah, so we'll keep an eye on that. Yeah. The big thing I want to talk about is this, this third-party candidate when it comes to governor in yeah. Idaho. Yeah. Ammon Bundy got, uh, so far, again, still waiting on official numbers, about 17% of the votes cast last night. Uh, and I want to say about f almost 590,000 votes for governor, all told. But he got about 17% of that. There hasn't been a third-party candidate get double digits in a long time in Idaho. So this is a big deal to see kind of where things stand within the Republican Party and then as a up-and-coming third party, possibly, in the state of Idaho. Yes. I, now, Bundy's a candidate who started as a Republican, sure. saw that he was going to have a stiff fight, and for whatever set of reasons, mm -hmm. you know, decided to run as an independent. So uh, the odds against an independent winning are, are huge, right? right. Uh, but I, I do think you're right. This is 
highly unusual to see this big of a percentage vote for Bundy. To me, this just says this is an, an approximation of, of the part of the Republican voting public that is ready to go for the extreme candidate. Yeah, and I'm not saying we're going back to the 19th century because I was just doing some research, but you know, back in the early 1900s and the late 1800s, there were a lot of third party candidates that did pretty well, like 20%. You know, uh, Stunenberg won with 77%. Frank Stunenberg won yeah. with 77% out of the fusion party, whatever that may be. Uh, but that's just kind of one of those that's still out there. But the point is, it's been a long time here yeah. in Idaho, and this is kind of one of those things where people kind of go, okay, that may make a statement. He's a charismatic yeah. person. Uh, a lot of people know about him. He's been in the news repeatedly, not always in a positive light, but right. he's he gets a lot of name recognition. Sure. And maybe maybe this is a reflection of kind of the frustrated voter or the voter who's had it with all the parties and thinks Bundy might be a good choice. Yeah. One other last thing before you go. The race for coroner in Ada County. Yes. Uh, Dottie Owens has been there since 2015. Uh, she lost last night to the Republican candidate, which we all kind of saw. Uh, it's a partisan position, elected position <laughs> in the county, and that's statewide. Yeah. That is, uh, it's, it's a little weird. Uh, why do we elect a coroner and why is it a partisan office? Great questions. Right. Uh, the, every, whenever I say that, someone always repeats to me, yes, but the coroner is the only person who can arrest the sheriff. Oh, good point. Which doesn't come up every day. <laughs> but, uh, is that something we need to worry about? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, there are other ways to do that. Yeah. There are some states where, it, you know, where the counties have uh, made that an appointed position, uh, like a medical examiner. Right. Uh, we don't require that the coroner have any medical training. Does this fall into that category of what Nekachea said about people are just used to voting Republicans, so that's what they went with this time around? Well, I think that what you saw last night was uh, the fruits of a lot of effort and a lot of organization on behalf of the Republicans in Ada County. I mean, they, they won both of the commissioner seats yeah. and the coroner, you know, flipped the coroner seat. So I think, I think it's a demonstration that they were able to effectively turn out the voters. Okay. Dr. Stephanie Witt, thank you very much Thanks. for your analysis of this, of what happens last night, and we'll see how it plays out going into the legislative session coming up, well, probably in about six weeks. Yes. That's where we're going. All right. Yep. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay, so 9.02 p.m. That's the time the Associated Press declared Governor Brad Little won his second term to lead Idaho. 9.02. That's when they sent out their breaking news tweet. That's literally two minutes after the polls closed in the northern part of the state and about 10 minutes before any numbers were released by the southern part of the state where the polls closed an hour earlier. And they weren't wrong. I mean, Governor Little got more than 60 percent of the votes. A call so soon, it's not unprecedented, but it is certainly unheard of here in Idaho, even with such a super majority voting conservative. That the race for the top spot in the state was settled before the poll workers in the panhandle could even close their doors, well, that caught a lot of people off guard. While the last minute voters were still likely driving home last night, well, how can they do that? The AP says it will only declare a winner when it determines there is no way a trailing candidate can catch up. And the AP says, they have perfected a formula to figure that out. All right, to declare winners, you need numbers. And they add up like this. The Associated Press has reporters in all 50 states. On election night, according to the AP, they use those staff members. Plus, they pay stringers, freelance workers hired for a specific purpose. In this case, to report voting numbers. And there's about 4,000 of those scattered across the country. The AP also applies something called AP VoteCast, a research tool first used four years ago. It's a gauge of America's voters designed to show opinions about candidates, issues, and the future of the country. I know, it sounds pretty vague. But AP VoteCast uses a combination of mail, phone, and online research from tens of thousands of registered voters gathered by the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. Their surveys ask a standard set of demographic questions, you know, age, race, ethnicity, education level, and income. There are also a series of opinion-related questions, the direction of the country, issues they care about, stuff specific to their state. They also want to know who they voted for in U.S. Senate races, or for governor, what party their House candidate belongs to, that kind of stuff. Basically, they are looking for tendencies. All of that information, pulled from dozens of areas around a state, gets randomly mashed together with the actual vote count. An innovative statistical calibration methodology, they call it. 
Making the call on an election can take hours, especially in close races. But how can the AP make that call almost as soon as the polls close, like they did last night with Governor Brad Little? Wasn't there a third party factor promising to complicate matters? Well, history is the name of this game. You see, the AP keeps tabs on how a party or a candidate has done in the past. Convincing wins, like with state offices for Idaho Republicans over the past 20 years, qualify a race to be called early. A declaration, sometimes as soon as the polls close, give or take three minutes. In 2020, the AP says it was 99.9% .9 accurate in all of its race calls and perfect in declaring presidential and congressional races in each state. How do we know this? Well, the Associated Press put out an explainer on how they break this all down. Meanwhile, Senator Mike Crapo's race, that was called around the same time, earning him his fifth term in the U.S. Senate. Many of you may be asking, how is this AP vote cast different than, say, exit polling, where they ask people who they voted for as they leave their polling place? The AP admits that kind of polling is out of date. It may have worked in, say, 1972, when 95% of voters did cast their ballots in person on Election Day. But our ways and means of voting are way different these days. According to the AP, the last midterm election back in 2018, 43% of U.S. voters voted before Election Day. Absentee, mail-in, early voting. In 2020, that was up to 70%. In Idaho, we went from 23% in 2018 to 56% in 2020 voting early. Granted, those were the early days of a pandemic in 2020. But the point is, exit polling isn't as accurate as their AP vote cast. And their calling races has become much more scientific, as scientific as surveys and history can be. Okay, so the Greater Idaho Movement is getting, well, greater. Two more Oregon counties were considering the idea in yesterday's election. Both Morrow and Wheeler counties in the north central part of the state had it on their ballots. In Wheeler County, Oregon's least populated county, by the way, about 1,400 people there, 58% of them approved an advisory question that asked about moving Idaho's border to the west of Wheeler County. Wheeler County, that is, fitting since, according to Wheeler County's website, they've been called a place where the sidewalk ends and the old west begins. In Morrow County, home of Boardman Bombing Range, more than 60% of voters have tasked a board of commissioners with considering blowing up their curtain border with Idaho and moving it to the west side of, well, Morrow County. So that makes it 11 counties in eastern and central Oregon that have shown interest in convincing state legislatures to move that border to better align with Idaho's conservative political nature. Mike McCarter, the man who started this greater Idaho thing, says after 160 plus years, the line of eastern Idaho in the sand in eastern Idaho needs to be just redrawn. Eastern Oregon, that is. The boundaries are outdated, he says. After all, the Oregon-Washington border was just updated in 1958, so why not Idaho-Oregon's border next? So this might be a movement that could gain some more momentum now that the state has elected another Democrat as governor. Well, Iowa County will be next to decide if they want to be part of it. I mean, they redry, redraw those districting maps, right? The voting maps every 10 years, so why not this? It's still going to take both state legislatures to agree and a literal act of Congress if they want to make it happen.
Some of the reporting stations at the resorts anyhow, at least at this point, this is what I have from uh, research from today. Six inches of new snow at Bogus Basin, Brundage with nine, same thing with Tamarack, nine, and Sun Valley joined in the race there as well with eight inches of new snow, quite a bit of snow in the Central Mountains. Rain here in the valley. Now, in the way of rain, we've had now so far, and you know how it came down last night, right? The rain was really coming down. Nearly two inches of rain so far is what we've accumulated since the 1st of November. So the normal for the entire month, this is just the first eight days of this month, the more entire month is a little bit over an inch, so we are now almost an inch above normal with the precipitation. We were above normal last month, not quite like this, but here we are the second month of the water year, and we're above normal. So, you know, if you see that outside, and of course you're not dealing with it real well, at least it is helping us as far as we think as looking ahead to next summer, getting a good start. Right now you see that it's starting to clear out a little bit. You can see some of the sun a little bit trying to get through some of the clouds outside at the present time. And uh, most of the snow showers has moved down toward Mountain Home, uh, toward Gooding, as well as Twin Falls. It should be out of that location at about 10 o'clock for this evening. So you can see a little bit of the sun. It is looking better. We do have a developing inversion. Whenever you have a situation with snow on the ground and you have cold air that's coming in where warmer air could trap it. So we're going to watch this here over the next couple of days. There's a pretty good likelihood of that. As you see, the temperature tomorrow 34 and the lowest 17. So this forecast is based on that, even though it's dry throughout all of next week. That was the last storm system, at least for the next week or so. And you can see most of the lows are in the teens. Oh, they're really cold at night. And most of the daytime highs will be lower to mid 30s. So watch the wind chill likely in the upper 20s during the day.
All right, final moments of the show here on this post-election day show of the 208. Let's get to those right now. This one from Jack in Boise, referring to the greater Idaho movement where eastern Oregon's uh, counties would like to join the state of Idaho. Just what Idaho needs, says Jack, a bunch of counties in Oregon that cannot economically support themselves. We have plenty of those already. That's Jack's opinion of that. Oregon better think about it or they may get what they wish for, but all the drug dispensaries will be closed before they let Oregon join Idaho. I don't know. We'll never accept Oregon's liberal drug drug law, says Chuck and Amp. And that's kind of the point. They would then be under Idaho law. So, well, they would just kind of wipe them out just because of that, because they would have to follow Idaho laws. It would just be greater Idaho, but still Idaho. Democrats are the minority in Idaho. It's just the way it is. Hopefully common sense will prevail and the extreme voices will be less loud, says Liz. She went on to say, hopefully both sides will work together for the good of all Idahoans. And that kind of goes well with what this was sent in, this message sent in from Josh, who says, Phil McGrain saw him at a local restaurant. We enjoyed watching his 208 interviews. And that as Democrats, we are proud to vote for him. That's the kind of mentality I guess we need, right? We'll see you tomorrow.